All right, Steve, where are your goals? I'm going to gain five pounds in lean body mass. Actually, make it, make it 10. Yeah. It is 10. I just fluctuate. I fluctuate between 165 and 170 all the time. Okay, so what is your goal weight? I want to be, I want to be like a consistent 170, 175. Like not fluctuate between five, so 165 or 169, 170. By when? Mm, let's say by like the end of the summer. Yeah, let's say, let's say by my birthday. When's your birthday? Seventh. No, oh, seventh. Four. Not 78. Okay. Uh, whatever. Who cares? Okay. Uh, anything else? Or just that. Um, I want to look more lean, but you know, I don't like saying that. As a trainer, it hurts me to say that. Yeah, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole point. Um, <coughs> and I mean, really, because getting to 175 is easy. Just go eat some stuff. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but if the goal is to look leaner, it's okay, we've got to make sure we're getting the right stuff in there, we got to make sure you're training the right way, you yeah. eating enough to start with. So I kind of got to know that, because, yeah, we can get you up there, but if you're not eating right, yeah. you know, not good there. If you're not eating right, if you're overstressed, if you're not uh, dealing with stress well, that's going to be something else, too. So that is one thing. We'll probably spend more time talking about stress and stress management than we will about the food, which is perfectly fine. Yeah. So walk me through what you eat in the course of the day right now. It's been pretty bad lately. Um, between being sick and my dad, the whole thing with my dad, so I've been like slacking. But lately, I mean, I'm still doing, you know, you know, clean meat, chicken, or um, mostly just chicken. I haven't eaten fish in a while, and then I'll do like one or two days of red meat, like a like a steak or like um, beef bits, okay. and uh, turkey chili. And I always mix it with the same thing, vegetables, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, and carrots, really, yeah. and brown rice. Yeah. And but I don't measure anything. Okay. Just put it on the plate. So measurements aren't necessarily super important. When you look at, so when you look at a serving size of protein, you're looking basically at the palm of your hand. So you don't have to measure, you just have to be able to see, is that about that much? Yeah. Um, the same thing with carbs, looking at the size of your fist, this little guy will go with you everywhere. Um, one of the things you can do if you're grabbing something, is literally, would it be the equivalent of me grabbing my mm. whole fist when I'm doing it? So let's say you're grabbing like this, uh, stalks of asparagus or whatever, it's about that much. So it's an easy way to measure it out because you're always gonna have your hand with you. Um, same thing with you know potatoes, rice, things like that. So you're not necessarily measuring out, but let's say you grab a big uh, ladle full, mm -hmm. it's gonna be about the size of a fist. Yeah. Just by default, that's what the ladle's actually built for. So when you look at them, they're actually, they're pre-sized. You just don't realize it because you never take volume to volume. But if you take a big scoop, it's a rounded scoop, it's gonna be close to a cup. And if you take like a level scoop, it's close to a half cup. So um, that's the cool thing about kitchen utensils. Most of them are pre-sized. Then you have ladles, same thing. They're gonna be about a half cup, about a cup, about a quarter of a cup, depending on the size of it. So, it's actually easier to measure your food without actually measuring your food. Because from there, when you're looking at what you're getting in, you can, you can do it a bunch of different ways as far as counting calories. We don't need you to be ridiculously diligent about counting your calories, but are you eating enough food? Um, based on what you're saying, unless your volumes are pretty solid, you could be under eating. So, I don't know. I think I am, because I find myself hung more hungry more often than not. Okay. And my biggest thing was like, at first I was like, there's no way I'm hungry because I just ate. Like, yeah. It'd be like 15, 20 minutes later. And, then, and I thought at first it was the content of my meals, you know, yeah. not enough carbs or fats that are feel, making me feel satisfied. Because I eat like, I eat like at least two or three servings of protein yeah. each day. But the other problem is I haven't gotten an RMA, so I don't know what I'm supposed to actually be eating. <clears throat> Get your resting test. So the big thing with that is, and, and you know it, but it's how much are you supposed to be eating? Because right now, what you're eating is good quality. It's not bad. There's nothing that jumped out at me and said, "Hey, don't do this." But if you don't know how much you're supposed to be eating, you're eating based on rough guidelines. So based based on something your age, your weight, your height, your gender, your activity level, you're eating this. 
well, you're here, you're training, your stress levels are up, that's going to impact your carb need and carb utilization, mm -hmm. which is going to drive your appetite. You're working out, you're working, you, how many sleep do you get? On average? Yeah, maybe six hours a night. Is it good sleep or is it? No. That's shit sleep. I haven't been sleeping a lot. So, when you think about that, that's all going to impact metabolism. So, yeah, you may be eating, but because your stress levels are off, your sleep is off, your body's automatically going to go, okay, cool, you ate, there wasn't enough sugar in that meal, I need more carbs, I need more sugar, let's go over here, let's, let's tell you you're hungry again. Because the goal is, is your body is going to tell you you're hungry to find something that it needs. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it'll be, okay, we want, um, we want more carbs, we want more sugar, we want this, we want that. And it'll keep triggering it. In your case, it's going to trigger based on stress, not necessarily on fiber intake. Your fiber intake may be low, but we'll get into that later. But if you are not getting enough carbs in and you're not getting good quality sleep, stress goes up. So if your sleep is bad, your sleep is supposed to reset. So this is your stress line. So what should happen when you go to sleep, it dips down and it resets. What's happening in your body is it's here's your stress, you're sleeping, and it's going up. So it's having the reverse effect. You're getting crappy sleep, your body's running off sugar. Mm -hmm. Every time you get a sugar crash throughout the day or blood sugar dips, your mood is impacted. So it's negatively impacted. So your goal there is to find food. Well, you got appointment after appointment, you got this going on, you got that going on. So you may not be able to get food, so your blood sugar continues to trend down until either you get irritated enough where it triggers an adrenaline spike to release the sugar, mm -hmm. or until you get food in which case your blood sugar comes back up, you feel better. So the appetite can be stimulated by a bunch of different things. Mostly, I think it's gonna be stimulated more by stress for you than anything else that you may be doing or eating or not eating mm -hmm. because of the fact that your blood sugar is just chaotic, which is where the tracking the food comes in handy, but more importantly, the rest. So for you, you would actually wanna look at, pull it up real quick. So we have a product called Restore for you, that would actually be huge. So the two things that you would do as far as testing would be your um, resting test and mm -hmm. your stress resilience test. Mm -hmm. The main reason is right now, how long have you been stressed for? I mean, how long has life been kind of, well, you were sick, but I know your dad's recent. Uh, I don't know, probably since, uh, I guess since I moved out here. Okay. That's when it started getting like bad because that was like, you know, First time that I'm really on my own, you know. Which, I mean, makes sense. You've had a lot of life changes in a very long, short period of time. So this little guy is gonna help with sleep quality. Mm -hmm. um, so you can enhance the quantity and quality of your sleep. Right there, it says it, it must be true, it's on the internet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what it does is, depending on the person, so the average serving size is two capsules. I have to take about four. Um, my mom has to take about six. It's your body, your physiology, your lack of sleep. So her and I both deal with insomnia. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to get me to sleep well, four of these does the job. To get her to sleep well, six of these does the job. So it has nothing to do with gender, has nothing to do with size, she's smaller than I am and she's a female. So when you think about it, it's how stressed your body is. So you may take two of these, knocks you right out. Yeah. You may take four of these and be like, what the hell am I taking this for? you may have to take more. Yeah. Or you may take just one and be like, I'm a zombie, I can't function. The overdosing effect is it's just harder to get up the next morning. So you'll get up and you'll actually need coffee to get out of bed because it's the only way to burn this off. Then you can go backwards from there. So <clears throat> start low, of course, don't go two and then go four and then go six. Go two and enjoy it. Because what it is, the GABA is a precursor to melatonin, so it's gonna help set, reset the uh, circadian rhythm the tryptophan is gonna calm you down. So it's gonna calm you down, allow you to get to sleep. The GABA is gonna basically force you into that deep restful sleep. And then what happens is your sleep will actually cause that reset of your stress. So your stress goes from here, drops back down, then the next day starts off wherever it goes. So that could be absolutely huge for you. Do they sell that downstairs? We don't sell it downstairs. I've asked about that multiple times. I don't know the why behind why we don't sell it downstairs. We used to, and it was absolutely amazing. And now it isn't. And now it isn't. No, not there. Right now. <coughs> Did I not copy? So this is usually how I send out links to. So when I send this out to you, it'll have this link inside of it. So that... Oh, all you have to do is click on it. So you'll get this in an email form when we're done. Here it is, there you go, take it. It has the directions on it. 
And then, of course, the fact that I'm sending it to the website, if you forget how to take it, one, it's on the bottle. If you forget what it's for, it's all right here. So this way, you literally cannot forget what you're taking or why you're taking it. Mm -hmm. So it'll pop up and be like, oh, nighttime formula, I sleep my crap. Problem solved. So from there, if you're sleeping well or you're not sleeping well, your cortisol levels are going to go up, which is going to cause more sugar to be metabolized and mobilized. So if that's happening in your system, that's where that appetite's going as well. So I think that's why we should start there. Okay. The other thing, like I said, I touched on it, the stress resilience test is going to help you figure out where your cortisol levels are. You've been down here for how long? 10 months, almost. Yeah, so potentially the stress from that could be starting to impact your normal cortisol rhythm as well. Adding the restore is the easiest thing to figure out and see if that's going to fix it. If you add the restore, you start sleeping better, but you feel like your stress levels are still going up, mm -hmm. that's where the uh, stress resilience test would come in. You should be able to look at that and go, okay, this is what my cortisol looks like all day, and that's not what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to look, yeah. kind of curve down. So you may have low and then a spike in the middle of the day. It's going to tell you how to train and everything else. Um, and that's really going to be the big thing for you because if your goal is to gain more lean body mass, but your cortisol is high in the afternoon and you're doing high intensity workouts, you're driving your cortisol up, which mm -hmm. means you're going to sleep like crap, which means the next day is worse than the day before, than that day. Mm -hmm. So that helps us a ton there as far as training. How much water do you drink? Not enough. Okay. So the water, it's super overlooked. It's one of those things we need to be doing. Um, most people don't realize the impact that water has on their overall system, and that's where we have to start changing things. Um, because your metabolism will actually be impacted by about 3% based on your hydration. Mm -hmm. So if you're dehydrated, your metabolism goes down. If you're well hydrated, your metabolism goes up. So if our goal is to be leaner, we need more water coming in. Um, how much caffeine do you drink for the day? <laughs> Too much. <clears throat> so caffeine in and of itself is a diuretic, and you know this. What's going to end up happening though is as your body gets used to the caffeine coming in, it will decrease the amount of effects that it has, but it also causes water retention to offset the next day's caffeine ingestion. So what you end up with is basically just more water being added. And then of course, since you have to add more to get the same, add more caffeine to get the same effect, you keep adding more water on top of it. Not to mention the lack of sleep that also causes water retention. So for you, increasing the amount of water that you drink should actually cause you to start it, it, um, it should have a diuretic effect, so it should cause you to start releasing the water. Mm -hmm. Whether it's from stress, urination, I don't stress, but whether it's from sweat, urination, or anything else, that'll force all of that water out of your body, which will actually cause your weight to fluctuate less. And that's really what you want to see, because if our goal is training and gaining lean body mass, and your fluctu weight is fluctuating nonstop, it's more or less hydration that's causing that fluctuation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could be the potential of higher carb days versus low carb days that you may not be directly conscious of. So if you're having, let's say, four or five low carb days, and then by default, just on accident, you have a super high carb day, your body weight goes up. Mm -hmm. But your body weight, when you have those extra carbs, your body's gonna hold extra water inside the muscle, but that causes weight to go up as well. So now you're actually holding more water inside the muscle, which is great, it's gonna cause a better workout the next day, but that doesn't do a whole hell of a lot for the water that's not inside the muscle and not stored anywhere else. So you're just holding all that water with you. Yeah. Which, considering the fact that now you're adding weight to your body, could actually cause a negative effect because even though the carbs going into the system and having a positive effect on your lift, since your body weight is now more from the external uh, extracellular water and the intercellular water, you can actually feel worse while you're lifting. You feel like you're more out of breath, you feel like you're winded because you just gained five pounds of water in a day. Mm -hmm. So add five pounds to your body, carry it for the rest of the day, you're gonna feel like crap by the time you get through the day. Yeah. So it's not a true fat gain, but it's still five pounds on your system. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you use the sauna at all? Uh, I used to use it more, not, not as much recently though. So, <clears throat> dry sauna, 15 to 30 minutes a day. It helps to get rid of excess cortisol being produced by the body. You can't, uh, you cannot sleeping. Cortisol levels are up naturally. Add in external stresses still goes up. Um, it also helps the insulin sensitivity. Cortisol levels are high, there's more sugar floating around, there's more insulin present, you can't burn fat. So we wanna do that. 
going to help with growth hormone production. The goal is to get lean, growth hormone makes you lean, mm -hmm. so we mess with that. If you're not sleeping, you're not producing growth hormone, so your body's at a stalling point. So if you're in there and you're producing growth hormone, what will end up happening is it will not compensate for the sleep, but it will help to get that same growth hormone response. But what it should also do, since you're dumping out the excess cortisol, decreasing adrenaline, and increasing your um, heat sensitivity, mm -hmm. you should also help to reset the circadian rhythm. So what will happen is your body will be calmer when you get out of here, so then your stress levels should appear lower when you get to sleep, or when you get to sleep time, getting to sleep and sleeping deeper should be directly impacted almost instantly. Um, now there are changes to that, there are caveats to that. If you do it regularly and then you start increasing your carbs around bedtime, this actually happened to me last night, it was a horrible idea. Um, last night I got home and I wanted a bowl of oatmeal. And I've been doing the sauna for, I think today is 21 days. Um, I started before the challenge started. So last night I was like, I want to have a bowl of oatmeal, I don't have some raisins in it. I was so freaking hot, it wasn't even funny. Insulin sensitivity went up, my body storage capacity of carbohydrates went up, so I literally turned my body into an inferno before I was gonna get to bed. Mm -hmm. Horrible choice. So that could potentially <laughs> happen. Um, but it's one of those things, you'll get better sleep and then trial and error. You'll go and you'll find that you have to have less carbs at night. Or in your body, that may not happen, because carbs before bed could potentially cause that um, and, uh, serotonin spike, the, the dopamine spike, mm -hmm. which is what they should do. And in your case, that may be awesome for you getting to bed. Whereas getting fat in before you go to bed should also cause deeper sleep and things like that. But in my body, the carbs before bed with the amount of sauna work I've been doing, horrible choice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's trial and everything. So you may get through it and be like, hey, you know what, I had a potato before bed, I felt amazing, and I slept through the night, this guy's just an idiot, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> no, it's your physiology. Um, a month later, still getting in the sauna, that you may do the same thing, going, hey, I slept great last time, wake up the next morning and be like, oh my god, I didn't sleep, mm -hmm. it's horrible. So your physiology changes almost daily. From uh, the hypothermic conditioning, your body actually changes faster than anything else. So when you think about the speed of change, you know this is a trainer, your heart and lungs are gonna change faster than anything else, then your nerves, then your muscles and everything else. Your cells will actually respond faster to hypothermic conditioning than anything else because of the growth hormone output that comes from that. Mm -hmm. So you'll actually notice your tolerance to heat goes up, your cardiac output goes up, you won't, well, you'll notice it from the workouts, you won't be cognizant of it because they don't necessarily go hand in hand. Um, they go hand in hand, but it's not one of those things you think about while you're working out. Um, but because it responds so fast, it'll actually improve the speed at which your heart and lungs change, which means your your strength, your lean mass should go up a ton faster as well. All right. And and this is literally what we said at the very beginning. We're not gonna talk a lot about food, we talk more about stress yeah. and how it impacts the body. Because for you, the stress is actually the biggest part of what's inhibiting you from getting there. It's also what's causing the weight fluctuations, and because of what the stress is, you can't get rid of it. You're not coming in here saying, hey, I got a loud roommate. You're not coming in here saying, um, you know, my job sucks. It's, okay, I have life stuff. This is this is a life-altering issue. Yeah. Um, if it was something negligible, like, you know, my roommate leaves a light on at night. Well, let's turn it off. Yeah. You know, it, it's stuff like that we can handle. Um, with stuff like this, you have to find ways around your stress to deal with it versus, okay, cool, I've got stress, just like everybody else, I'm gonna, <laughs> bless you, thank you. I'm just gonna push through it. <laughs> okay, bless you, thank you. The vitamin D, actually, what supplements do you take right now? Uh, I take the protein, the you can, and I'm trying to start taking the, uh, the performance vitamins, yeah. Okay, why trying? i really forgetful. Okay, awesome, this one's easy. I like this problem. So this is actually the exact same conversation that Katie and I just had. When you look at technology, technology is built to make your life easier. <clears throat> so you have the ability to program like 15 alarms for one day and hit repeat. So most days you get up at the same time, you eat breakfast at the same time, you use things at the same time. Set an alarm to remind you, and you can flat out put a note in there that says, take vitamins. Do it in the morning, do it at night. What that'll do is it'll help you a ton to remember because it's not a habit, so why would you remember to do it? Yeah. So you take them in the morning because, okay, that's easier. Or you take them at night because, okay, I'm home. Cool, you set the alarm for about the same time that you would normally be taking everything else or getting ready for bed or whatever else. This way it goes off, you're like, oh, I gotta take those. Eventually it becomes a habit because the alarm won't need to go off anymore and you're like, okay, I gotta take my vitamins. In about 15 minutes, that alarm's gonna go off. Awesome, then once it's a habit, you get rid of the alarm. Mm -hmm. 
But the other thing that will happen is if we start taking the vitamin D, um, that will help a ton as far as insulin sensitivity as well. It helps to de-stress in the body and it actually affects you on a chromosomal level. So without getting too in depth, it'll actually help with coping with stress from the cellular level of your body all the way out. So that's something you definitely want to add. But if you're going to add it, either take it with um, fat of some sort or get it from sunlight. Mm -hmm. So if you get it from sunlight, it has to pass through fat. It's easier absorbed. Do you know where your body fat is right now? Yeah, it's like 12 or 13. Okay. It varies, sometimes 14. That's fine. It's low enough. When you're fat, <coughs> fat body fat itself is inflammatory, which is going to cause stress. But if your fat levels are too high in your body, it's a fat-soluble vitamin. So it'll literally hit a wall of fat, get stuck there. So if it's coming from the sunlight, that's awesome, but it'll hit and get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll get a percentage. So think about wearing like a jacket around whatever the fattest part of your body would be. You won't get it all there, you'll get it everywhere else that's leaner. Yeah. So in your case, you have a low enough body fat, it'll get absorbed right through. So you can do the vitamin D in the sense of a pill, or you can get in the sun for about 15 to 20 minutes per day, direct exposure. So about 75% of your skin exposed, should get through. Mm -hmm. um, if randomly you jumped up and let's say you gained 30 pounds all in your midsection, that's where things get kind of tricky because now that midsection fat is absorbing all the vitamin D that's hitting it. Okay. So you'd literally be like putting a blanket over your abdominals. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> everywhere else would still get it, but not there. So that's where the, the ingestion would be. If you have the time, if you don't have the time, then taking a pill would be huge. Combine it with fish oil, combine it with some sort of fat because that'll help with the absorbency of it. Okay. Um, but the whole thing there is again, insulin sensitivity, stress management. So you can kind of see your focus is not on modifying foods, it's about getting more water in. Because if you're gonna get in the sauna, you're gonna need more water, yeah. period. Um, the only way for your body to put out all the gunk that's inside of it that it needs to get rid of is water. Water is your primary transport for everything. Whether it's cognitive function, whether it's blood, whether it's whatever, it's based out of water. So if you're getting more water in, you can get more gunk out. Um, and of course, if you're getting in the sauna, you're not getting water in, you'll pass out and die and bad things. Mm -hmm. That's an extreme case, but you know where it's going. Because what will happen is your body should have enough ability to regulate you for about an hour in there. Even if you didn't have adequate hydration while you were in there. Mm -hmm. Because you should, since fat is basically water and everything else, if it's mostly water, it should be released in order to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. Because your body wants to survive more than anything else. So looking at that, if you have enough hydration going in, your body can actually release that water, which is going to decrease inflammation, decrease the inflammatory effects of the fat cells, increase insulin sensitivity, growth hormone, everything else that I've listed. And from there, what you end up with is your body's ability to bounce back, recover, and feel better, which means stress levels go down, which means then we can actually get into your foods, because even though they're not bad, there's always going to be room for improvement. Yeah. But we start here because if your stress levels continue to go up, blood sugar goes up, if your fasting glucose is high, your body goes to sugar for fuel, and it doesn't care about fat. Mm -hmm. so, okay. What questions do you have for me? Um, for, for serving sizes, just for, I know we said we're not really talking about food, but for the proteins, carbs, and fats, for serving sizes, like what on average do you think I should be getting for each one? I know it varies per person and per, for, her body weight and stuff, but just so it's easier for me to track. If you're thinking about protein, um, you said right now you're currently sitting at like 160 to 165. 165 to 170. 165 to 170. So you can actually look at the numbers real quick. You can't spell. You can't do anything with that. <laughs> it's because it's Sunday. You shouldn't even be here. I'm misspelling my name earlier would be the funnier part. Um, 165 times <clears throat> 24. So on the low end, you're looking at 141. So grams. basically six, yeah. Uh, 141 grams of protein, 142. So you're looking at basically, s yeah, six to eight palms of oh, protein. Protein? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's without shakes. That's without anything else. That's obviously that. A shake is going to be about 25 grams, so if you have two shakes, you would only need four pounds of protein. If you have three shakes or whatever, if you have big shakes with 50 grams in them, obviously you need less. And it's more of a guideline to make sure you're getting the right amount of food. Like yeah. they say, you think you're under eating, I think you're under eating. So you don't leave here and go, he said six, I'm going to do six. You're not going to feel well, 
Um, potentially, depending on how long it takes for your appetite to kick up to match the amount of food that you need, mm -hmm. that's where things get interesting. Based on your stress levels, you're probably going to need about six to eight pounds of carbs as well. Okay. So yeah, because your, your goal is to build muscle and your goal is to burn body fat. But because your stress levels are high, you're burning through sugar all day, so you have to keep the carbs a little bit higher to maintain appropriate blood sugar. Mm -hmm. When we get you sleeping better, we can cut your carbs down a little bit, as long as it doesn't impact performance. What may happen is your sleep build quality goes up, your fat utilization also goes up, you may not need to modify your carbs at all. Mm -hmm. um, or you may be one of those people we have to take very low carb, so we'll find that out as we go. Um, vegetables, this should be somewhere between seven and nine all the time. All the time. Um, ideally, it's 21 servings per day, yeah. which would be nine fists. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So, nine fists, six fists, six to seven fists, and carbs. You think you, think you want me doing a little bit more just until my body gets used to what we're doing? Yep. And then this little guy too. What we'll find out is how much sugar you're burning at rest. And so that resting test will tell us how much sugar, how much fat you're burning. And that'll also indicate how many uh, servings of carbs you're having per day. Because from that we can look at, let's just say for numbers purposes, you're burning a thousand calories a day. So and sixty percent of that. Oh, it's six hundred. Why am I doing that this way? I'm special. So. <laughs> So you basically could end up meeting somewhere around 150 grams or more or less depending on how much sugar you're burning per day. The more sugar you burn at rest, the more carbs you're going to have to eat in order to get your body to balance out. Okay. So once it starts getting used to those external carbs coming in, it won't go to blood sugar as much, which means it'll be easier for you to maintain your blood sugar throughout the day. You won't have as many ebbs and flows in adrenaline and cortisol as well. Okay. Um, what tends to go screwy is if you have high stress, high sugar burn, and then you cut the carbs out in order to drop body fat. Your, your body can't sustain the energy output because it's going to burn through all the sugar it's got in there trying to get the fuel that it needs because it won't go to fat. And then once your body's calmer, it automatically starts shifting into fat and then potentially, depending on where everything else falls for you, you may not need as much carbs or you may be able to get a ton more carbs in and still maintain that lean mass. Okay. But it just comes down to how your body's going to adapt as we go. Okay, so the biggest thing is just to start getting my stress level back down, get better sleep. Yeah, so for you, <clears throat> The, the three items I would leave you with, sleep, get the restore, or I mean, literally working on getting high quality sleep is gonna come from immediately the sauna and more water. That's gonna be the two things that you can do today to impact that one thing. Um, but that's a time thing. So yeah. if you have the time to do it, by all means, go in the sauna and don't don't worry, like I put 15 at the low end, if you can only get in there for five, it's get fine. in there for five. Because what'll happen is when you walk in there, you're gonna feel, depending on how tightly wound your central nervous system is, you may feel like um, claustrophobic, you may start feeling anxiety, you may start feeling a lot of things. There's a dynorphin spike, this is the opposite of endorphins, it's gonna spike until you get the hell out of there. Because your body is built to avoid pain and discomfort. So until your body gets acclimated to that, you may be able to last five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Eventually you'll get to a point where your body will be okay with the heat, you'll start sweating better, you'll acclimate faster, and that's where the 30 minutes come in. All right. All right, <clears throat> sir. Can't think of anything else. Definitely get that restored. Yeah. Get some fish oil. Yeah, fish oil and vitamin D we do have downstairs. 